Hey everyone, thanks for joining. Today I'm speaking with Lee Justin. Lee is a professor of social psychology at Rutgers, and uh, I started following him on Twitter a little while back, mainly because he was talking about problems in, in psychology, in some of the social science fields, like methodology and things like that. Um, so I just figured I'd get him on and talk about it. Hey Lee, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, um, so I was guessing, like, uh, if you wanted to give a bit of your origin story, like, uh, give people a bit of your background stuff, and then, you know, we could start talking about the, uh, you know, like, the the methodology and all that, and just go from there. Yeah, sure. I uh, um, never planned on being an academic. I hated school. Like, I really hated school. Like, I viscerally hated school. Um and actually, I did go to college. I dropped out three times because I really hated school. <laughs> <laughs> and the time that ended up as the final time that I went back and completed, um, I, you know, when you, I, I didn't have any direction. And so when you don't have something you really want to do, it makes sense to just like do something to make money, right? Like it's not like you want the thing intrinsically. So why not like make boatloads of money? So when I went back to school, I was like, okay, I'm going to major in economics or business or something like that, you know, because that's the route, the most obvious route to money. I mean, there are other obvious. You could make, go pre-med or pre-law, but anyway. So, um, so I did that. And I was, having been in school several times previously, I knew by then that the bureaucratic systems that drive these schools were just insane. And they, they're probably best described as callous, but I viewed them as malicious. So I, I, I was ready to go back to school. I wanted to um, take a small course load because I had been out of school for a while and wasn't sure how I would handle it, but I was worried that I would believe that I had successfully registered for a couple of courses, but this evil system would not actually, which would communicate to me that I had successfully registered, but when I would show up to class, I would have been deregistered or unregistered or not eligible for these courses. And I didn't want to waste the time of like spending a semester taking one course. So, I decided to take extra courses, register for extra courses, figuring that I would drop them after, if everything actually worked out. This bureaucracy was not actually out to get me. So the bureaucracy was actually not out to get me. So now I have this five course load. The two other courses I took, I decided to take, well, I already had, I was taking an economics course, I was taking a calculus course, which you needed for all this advanced stuff. Um, I decided to take these, like, extra courses in the field that I despised least when I had previously gone to college. And that field was psychology. But it made, it's not like I liked it. I didn't like it. I hated it. I just hated it a little less than I hated everything else. So I took two psych courses. And what I found was by the, by the end of the ad drop period, which was like two or three weeks later, it was like when you had to decide which courses you're going to stick with, I loved both these courses. I totally loved both courses. Neither course had a particularly charismatic professor. One, his style was a droning, dull bore. And I still loved the course. And only at, at that point, it was over. I, like, I was just done. It was like, I'm going to take all five courses, and I just poured my heart into the psych stuff. So, I, you know, a year later, I was doing an honors thesis with an undergraduate. Um, my, uh, my honors advisor had gone to Harvard and was really kind of plugged into, into how things work. I applied to grad school, loved grad school. And despite the extent to which I bitch and moan about academia in general and psychology in particular, I love this job. I totally love it. It was one of the best decisions I've ever made. Okay, I mean, like I, I know, like I said, I, I mentioned that I, I followed you because of the stuff with the academia, and you know, I'm not an academia, but I, I, I'm kind of vocal about what I see in it. But I mean, the more I see, the more I look into it, and it's you know, you start realizing it's not, 
it's the administration end of the academy more so than it is anything else. I, I you know there are certain faculty members, there are certain fields, but like from okay again, I'm from the outside looking in. That's what it seems like to me. It's it's, it's more the administration end that's really heavy on, you know, whatever the the, the grievance stuff, you know, like than it is except unless you're in those fields. Right. I, I think that's actually right. And I, I mean, it's right. And there's pretty good evidence on that. There's, um, uh, I think he's a political scientist, Sam Abrams at Sarah Lawrence college, um, who did a survey on this. So there's all the survey evidence showing that the faculty, especially in the social sciences and humanities, which is where sort of politically charged stuff is likely to get done, you don't get a lot of politically charged stuff in physics or chemistry. I mean, maybe a little once in a while, but not very often. Um, but so in the social sciences and humanities, um, the skew, the left-right skew is immense. Uh, depending on where and how you count, it's anywhere from about six or eight to one to like infinity because there are literally no people right and center on faculty, and especially the, the elite uh, uh, research-oriented social science and humanity programs. Okay, so that's, that's the, the academic side. But the, uh, so there's, and there's abundant survey showing that. Abrams comes in and surveyed administrators, and the skew is even worse among the administration. And, and, and like, like, to demonstrate the severity of this, like, sort of mix of things, he then got attacked and mobbed for simply posting the data in the New York Times. In a new, I mean, this is the New York Times. This is not like some, you know, nut case, you know, radical right wing outlet. Yeah. This is, you know, just publishing the data showing that the administrators are even more left than the faculty. And he was harassed and targeted. Was, his office was vandalized. He was threatened, you know, he, and he was effectively driven off campus. Um, and he got some temporary position outside for a little while. Um, and your point about the administration is correct because fundamentally it was the administration's job to stand up for him and protect him. And they didn't, they, it's not like they did nothing, but their response was really tepid. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, like the the, the whole thing, because I mean, I, I see it a lot, and I mean, I am I'm 100% guilty of it myself. You know, like, oh my God, the academy's this and the academy's that, and it's, but okay, and I'm not saying that you know we've always done it like this way. We have to do it this way, but that was, you know, it's worked to a point and it's worked really well. Right? You know, you know, you have the Hawkins of the world coming out of it. You have the you know Richard Dawkins. Yeah. Of the, you know, you have the John Hanks yeah. of the world coming out of it. So there is something worth saving, but I don't know, like lately I'm just, there's, I mean, they're, they're harming themselves and then there's attacks coming from all sides. There's, you know, there, you hear it from the far right. Oh, well, you can't go you know, all the elite schools. And I know you mentioned the word elite, but I mean, yes, Harvard is an elite school, but the way you hear it from the far right, it's, you know, it's. It, it, it's got another connotation to it, and the way you hear it from the far left, right. another connotation to it. Right. And they're they're, they're it's, it's destroying itself, and it's you know we need a, repos a repository of knowledge. We need a place where people yeah. can learn and think. But I don't know if that's happening in the academy. Um, but, which I think like kind of leads me like to where I started following you from was the the problem with like replication, the problem with some of these fields. So. You know, uh, Brett Weinstein said, you know, came with the term ideal laundry. So you have some of these fields that come out and, you know, oh, well, we've got peer reviewed data. We've got this. We've got that. Now, peer review sounds all well and good, but w what's the methodology and how's the review being done? Right. Like, I think that therein lies the problem. So if you want to go into a bit of that and talk about, like, the replication and how that goes. Or yeah. Well, so, so my, I, like, I don't, I, I'm, um, I'm really ambivalent about all, uh, the big picture aspect here. So, you know, I routinely get sort of Twitter replies from what I suspect are my mostly right wing. So, uh, I did a Twitter poll a while ago, 
and my followers are across the ideological spectrum. So when I say from my mostly right-wing followers, it's not that I have mostly right-wing followers. It's like almost a, like a third, a third, and a third, left, yeah. right, middle. Um, but this kind of tweet, I suspect, I don't really know, is mostly from my right-wing followers, my followers who are on the right wing, which is just tear it all down. You know, I'll, I'll tweet some, you know, expose of some terrible thing in academia, and the some responses will be just just take it down and start all over. And I understand that. Like, I don't, I, I don't want to be torn down. I, like I said, I love my job. I, I, I agree with you that there is a lot of really good, constructive, you know, societally valuable stuff going on in most universities, maybe almost all of them. So I don't want to tear it all down. But but I, but the sentiment resonates with me. Like I get why somebody would would want to see this would see this ridiculousness, and it's like why are we spending state for state universities, yeah. state tax dollars, and federal grant money to support universities that support this kind of ridiculous ridiculousness? So I, I, I don't think that's the end of the story. But but I do understand the sentiment actually. I mean I completely understand the sentiment. So, um, but my hope is that they're wrong, that that's too far, that, mm-hmm. that it is, you know, it is, I mean, I do think of it as kind of like an intellectual infection. I mean, there's just some really bad stuff. And then the issue is, or one way to think about it, is do, do those of us who are in the academy, who see this, is our intellectual immune system up to fighting this infection? And I don't know the answer to that. Uh, that, that. That question is in doubt. And this manifests in tons of ways. So within psychology and the broader natural and social sciences, there is a concerted effort to both expose, acknowledge, and then improve on all sorts of Sort of, I think of them as hardcore, scientific, dysfunctional practices and processes. And this is on the science side. So it's bad statistics, bad methodology, um, a, a bad theory, a bad measurement. And, you know, it's this sort of critical soul searching that is intended, is willing to be destructive because I, some of it. I think people would say this is such a bad way of doing things. We should not do things this way. Work that has done things this way is bad and should not, doesn't deserve credibility. But in addition to tearing the stuff down, this group, I mean, I think of them broadly as sort of science reformers, are trying to improve, trying very hard, and uh, to improve those practices uh, and methods and statistics so that we can go forward and actually and discover stuff that's actually true. So that's on the method side. But then there is stuff on, uh, you know, broadly the political side, which it's not just, it's not necessarily purely political in the ideological side. It's almost anything on the fuzzier side. So I have a paper on just relentless follow-ups in how people interpreted their study. So this is the link between the methods and the conclusion. And there's no methodological fix to that. It's not like, well, if you do a different statistic, now you'll interpret it better. And maybe sometimes that's the case, but it, often it, that's irrelevant to, to the problem of interpretation. And that's where the sort of political biases and the political skew really matters. It's not restricted to politics, you can get similar kinds of distortions and biases in the scientific literature for purely theoretical reasons, like it's dominant theory prevents people from saying things, um, for personal reasons. So I'm a powerful, you know, eminent, established professor. So anything kind of in the topic area that is similar to mine comes through me and my students, and if it says anything different, we don't let it into the literature. So that can happen for non, non-ideological reasons. You put all, all of that together, it's fuzzy and difficult to crack. I don't, I don't like the terms hard and soft sciences because to me, science is more of a methodology. And if you follow that methodology, you're practicing science. 
you know, more or less. Uh, more or less. But if you take something like psychology and you take something like sociology, I think psychology you can say is more on the science end of things than psych- sociology. And it's got more testable stuff. But again, you're you're dealing with okay, dealing with physics, right? Quantum physics is really screwed up. You know, I, I don't even want to begin to say that I know anything about it, but, you know, the little I've read, whatever, it's very screwed up. But there is there is measurements, there's things you can take, you know, it's like it's one of the most uh, prophetic theories they've got. Like, you know, one, it's, it's been proven over and over and over again. We understand that. But like something like psychology, like you're dealing with people. And I think that's a lot more complicated than quantum theory. Right. So, yeah. So that that's true. That is absolutely right. I, I completely agree with that. And I mean, look, I'm a social psychologist. It's what I know best. Might things be somewhat different in neuroscience, you know, sort of psychological psychological subset of neuroscience or certain areas of cognitive science. Yeah, they, they probably are somewhat different, um, but not completely. But in my home discipline of social psychology, which, you know, deals with, for the most part, I think of social psychology as understanding, like, the psychology of everyday life. Why do, you know, people, it's not about psychopathology. So people without any obvious psychopathology, why do they do what they do? You know, why do they think they do what they do? What are uh, what are the uh, um, Sources, what are the influences on what they do? What are the, the, how do they influence other people? It's sort of like everyday life. Okay. But that turns out to be unbelievably complicated. It, it's so complicated, I, I think. I mean, maybe we just don't have the strong enough theory to make it not complicated. But okay. But then we don't have the strong enough theory to make it not complicated. So as a result, there is so, our, Method. This is the core. This is the to me. This is the great message of the science reform movement within social psychology, and that is our methods are so weak that it is very, very difficult for us to produce new knowledge, like a, a genuine new discovery about what makes people tick, that actually is true. It's not impossible. It's been done, but it's very, very difficult. And the difficulty is far vaster than even I thought for most of my career and is far more difficult than I would guess most of my colleagues in social psychology even today still believe. So for most of my career, get concrete. So for most of my career, if someone obtained a result with a, uh, a sufficiently uh, low level of, uh, uh, if somebody obtained a statistically significant result, so statistical significance has this very technical meaning in the world of statistics, um, it was, and I'm not going to go into what that means, because what it means is actually poorly understood, and it's like a whole a, a whole subset of the dysfunction is a, it involves actually a, 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 an entire minor area is the misinterpretation and misunderstanding of statistics. A narrow corner of that is the unjustified and misunderstanding of what the term statistical significance even is. There are now articles on why that should be abandoned completely, and I find them convincing. So those are, so, and I realize I'm doing a tangential detour, but because the convention in my field for decades has been if you publish a statistically significant result, you've now established a new fact. You've, you know, you've discovered something that's real, and no one has the right to gainsay it to say, well, I really doubt this, because you've published it. You've published a statistically significant result in a peer-reviewed journal. So, one, there's these problems with the use of even the concept of statistical significance. Two, there's the issues involving the statistics that have produced the statistically significant result. And three, the replication has shown that there can be tons of studies 
producing statistically significant results. But when someone tries to replicate it a priori, more often than not, they fail. So that complex of things has led me to the conclusion that there is far more uncertainty about almost everything we have ever done than any of us have ever dreamed. Hey, um, <laughs> well, that, 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 that's a little, you know. So, so basically you're telling me we should not listen to Dr. Spock? <laughs> we should, you know, so that's a whole other... I, I, um, there's so many there's so many aspects of this. You know, people making proclamations about things about which they have no expertise. Mm. So no, you know, that doesn't mean they're wrong, but you know, they kind of posture themselves as if you should believe me because I'm an expert. And they might actually be an expert on something over here, but that's not what they're opining about. They're 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 you know, making proclamations about something that is not in their area of expertise. This happens all the time. Yeah. And I mean, okay, that's one thing. Like right now, um, I've talked to a couple of people about this. Like, this is where I think the academy and the media, and when I say the media, I'm not, you know, like I'm not talking fake news or whatever. They just, like, it's, they've let us down. Is we, the average general population doesn't trust expertise anymore because you have so many conflicting ideas. Is, you know, everyone's saying everyone else is wrong. Um, you know, <laughs> No, but I mean, it's, it's like, who, 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 you know. So, so I kind of like to think about this. this, this is, I think that's right. There, there, I, there is informed, so this is, your, you're now at the, the frontier of my thinking on this, right? Because the issue is, I, I don't think you want to just throw out experts. You know, it's like they're all idiots and you can't believe anything they say. That, that's probably not a good idea. And, and because what's the alternative? Well, you know, the experts are all idiots, so I'm going to believe my barber. You know, I, I'm going to believe, you know, my, this propaganda website that I follow. Like, no, there's like not really great alternatives. So, so there's like informed, to me, I've come around, to, I've begun to think about this as informed versus just sort of, I don't know, self-serving or ignorant dismissal of experts. Experts' proclamations should almost always be taken with gigantic grains of salt unless you have the expertise to understand what underlies them or you know they have an amazing track record of, of, of getting things right. So um, uh, what's, what's the, the, uh, the, the big investment guy in uh, Omaha? Uh, uh, he, um, uh, uh, Ron Buffett. Okay. Ron Buffett has this amazing track record of investment success. So I don't really know how he does it. Um, you know, you could find out if you wanted to. But because he has a multi-decade-long record of success, like, I can't really blame somebody for saying, well, Buffett says so, so, you know, I'm going to go along with that. That's, you know, that this is credible. There are very few experts with that kind of record. There are some, but there are not many. It doesn't mean they're wrong, and it doesn't mean they're less credible than the talk radio guy that you listen to. It, it doesn't mean that. So there is like a, a critical sort of a, a, um, a critical evaluation of when, when you know, of when and how you should believe what particular expert, which doesn't equate to, therefore, I'm going to believe somebody even less credible than this expert. Yeah, I mean, but the, I mean, that's where we are. But, like, I'll, I'll give a sort of an al analogy, and I, I'm going to probably screw this all up, but, like, what you were talking about there, like, okay, going back to physics, like, again, quantum theory is one of the most successful theories that's out there. Now, coming out of the math of that, you get string theory, right? Now, again, you know, all I know is the little bit I've read on it, but it's not, okay, string theory is not falsifiable. You cannot perform those experiments. But there's, quantum theory was so right for long enough that there is enough people willing to invest the time into the math that right. says, okay, this is true. Now, granted, you know, 
like Neil deGrasse Tyson said, you give them a pad and a, a pad, of, uh, you know, a pad of paper, a pencil, and a laptop, and they're happy because it's all theory. So fine, it, it doesn't cost the academy too much. Let them do the work, right? But it's the same thing there. Like, okay, if Warren Buffett invests in a stock, if he got the money, you might consider putting money in it because the guy's right more often than he's wrong. Right. And it's the same thing here. So, but like in the social sciences, you know, like implicit bias. Right. That got a lot of attention and it sounded good and it looked great. Oh, Harvard's got like, I don't know, 50,000 people or I, I can't remember how many tests they had online. Yeah. yeah. But that's turning out to be you know, Dubious. false. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. And, you know, very questionable at the least. You know, so. Yeah. Like, there yeah. is no gold standard. Like, I mean, you know, what, is Skinner's box the gold standard? Or like. <laughs> <laughs> Right. So, part of our one one dimension, one of the many. Again, this is just one piece, but one one of those pieces that causes trouble in psychology is that very few of what passes for theories or theoretical ideas or the, even the basis for just generating a hypothesis is presented with clear statements of falsifiability. So people almost never say, well, here's my theory, and, and if we find this, it would show my... It, it may not show my... It's very hard to falsify an entire theory, but it shouldn't be that difficult to falsify a theory's predictions in a particular context. And we don't even have that. We don't, I mean, we almost never have that. Very few papers in psychology, generally, certainly in social psychology, have explicit statements as to what would falsify their predictions. And so what that permits is, and this is tied to another dysfunction, which is that in my field, people kind of identify with their findings in theory. Like, it's not, you know, it's, it's not just that it's like theory of evolution or theory of relativity, which, you know, somebody invented them, but they're accepted as, like, sort of reasonably good working descriptions of how things are. Uh, you know, you can test it, and it's not like, a, you know, a reflection on your ego, how this comes out. But that's the, in social psychology, theories and findings you know, are identified with individuals. And so if someone tests and fails to find that, that is often reacted to as if it's a threat, as if it's a, you're like a ego threat, it's a professional threat, right? It's kind of saying your work, it, it, it's, impl- it's interpreted, I don't think it means this, but it's often interpreted as implicitly saying you're a bad scientist, you did bad work. That's why I'm disconfirming. That's why your hypotheses have been disconfirmed here. I don't think people are saying that. I mean, sometimes they might be saying that. I don't think they are usually saying that. They're just testing the damn theory. So, but, but because of that mess of dysfunctions, when you have someone falsifying, you know, failing to confirm some theory's predictions, you often get this very defensive response on the part of the original authors or the advocates of that theory who will then bring in new arguments saying, no, 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 that's not really what the theory predicted. It wasn't a good test of the theory. It didn't do that. And in fact, if you did it the right way, you would have, you know, right? And so that makes it, the core problem underlying that is in the absence of statements of falsification, you know, well, that might be plausible, might be true, could be, not impossible, you know? And they're all smart, they have PhDs, most of them have been writing for years, they can construct a plausible founding argument. It's like, oh, yeah, it wasn't a good test of the theory, yeah, I'm actually on a good point, you know? And, and so we end up with this messy morass of unresolvable findings. Okay, but right there, like, if, if, your, <laughs> if your answer is... Like, okay, let's say, you know, you come out with a paper and it's, you know, and someone else says, okay, you know what? Uh, you know, this, this, and this was good. This, this, and this was bad. And you get all defensive and, 
say, well, you're not judging it the way, it, you know, you, it's, it's, I, I hear it from, you know, it's like from Muslims and stuff. Well, you didn't know the true Islam, right? It's like, oh, you didn't know. But like that answer in itself, like it, your work might not say you're a bad scientist, right? But you taking, and, and when I say you, I'm sorry, like I don't mean like you, but, but someone taking that stance, that stance in itself is proving the point that you're not doing good science. Uh, well, so I do see it that way, but you have to remember, a lot of this is under the radar. Like, no one will say, you've accused me of being a bad scientist. What they'll say is, your study or studies that failed to replicate or failed to confirm my predictions, those are the bad studies, not my original study. That, that's, how the, that's the level at which this will get, you know, kind of debated. This, there is a subtext. I, I want to show you. I want to share a screen with you. I sure. I'm going to attempt to. Can you see this red and green thing? Yep. Okay. So I'm going to. And can you see it reasonably clear? Ah, no, yep. I didn't want to do that. I want to go back here. Ah. Where to go? Back, okay. There we go. Okay. Yeah, I can. I can see it. Okay. All right. So. This is from a paper that came out a couple of years ago. It's not my paper. Um, uh, the, um, I only knew of one of the authors who is prominent in the science reform effort. This, what this chart shows is how really, I mean, this is not even political. This is on the, this is a, this chart refers to about a hundred, each dot in the chart is a study on the effectiveness is the results of the study on the effectiveness of antidepressant interventions. Um, some were medical, some might have been clinical, you know, like, like clinical psychology. And the red, what the red dots are, okay, so what, what this overall, what the, what's going on here is how really mixed, exceedingly mixed findings get sort of morphed or, or wandered, to use Weinstein's term, into a beautiful, clear consensus. So I'm going to walk you through how this works. So the, and I have a blog on this, so it's very easily acceptable. I can send you the link. Um, the, the, the leftmost column, the red dots are studies that failed to show the intervention was effective at reducing depression. The green dots are studies showing the intervention succeeded at alleviating the symptoms of depression. And what you can see at a glance in that left column is about half the study succeeded and about half failed. Okay. The next column is publication bias. So this gets back to the statistically significant thing. The, the statistical significance is often a gatekeeper to publication. It's hard to get things published if you don't have a statistically significant result. So what that shows, what the second column shows, is that nearly all of the successful studies got published, whereas only about half of the unsuccessful studies got published. So starting with empirical research that is about half effective and half ineffective for reducing depression, what gets into the published literature, which is the only thing that the rest of us can ever find, the published literature is about three quarters uh, um, intervention effective. It Jeez. gets worse from there. The next column, the third column, is what they call outcome reporting bias. So let's, what, what that refers to is let's say I do one of these studies and I have three outcome measures. You know, self-report, do you feel better? Maybe you get reports from a significant other. Does the person behaving better? You know, are you, how, how you know, how motivated, just maybe an interview with a clinical psychologist. So there's like three different measures. One shows things got worse. One shows no effect. And one shows things got better. I mean, I'm inventing a hypothetical. I'm not saying this exact thing happened, mm -hmm. but this is what this column is capturing. So you have three variables. One shows the depression got worsened, one showed no effect, and one showed things got better. And you can get this. Like, I might say, I'm not really feeling any better, but maybe the clinical psychologist says, well, you know, they, in, in, in a session, they seem much better than they did previously. You totally can get those kind of results. Okay, what outcome, the third column is outcome reporting by it. They only report the one variable where people got better. 
<laughs> and the overall is there's no effect. <laughs> like, like, there is one variable showing the positive effect. They only report that variable. By the time you get there, the published literature, the scientific peer-reviewed literature, is about 80-85% effective. It continues. The next column shows spin. What they mean by spin in these studies, in these papers, is consider the same pattern of finding, you know, uh, you have three outcomes. One makes things worse. One shows no effect. One makes things better. Sometimes they'll report all three. So it's in there. But what they'll say is that variable where things got better, that's the one that really counts. The others are not that important. Don't pay attention to them. Pay attention only to this one. And what's worse, they will do that even if in a proposal, so often there's a, like a grant proposal or a pre-registration where they articulate what the most important outcomes are. The most important outcome before the research was conducted might well be the variable on which things got worse. But by the time it gets published, what they say is the most important outcome is the one where things got better. It then continues. The final column is what gets cited. So other people drawing on the literature to reach conclusions about the effectiveness of these antidepressant interventions. The final column shows citation bias. People are more likely to cite the studies finding or at least claiming to have found effective interventions and ineffective interventions. So what you end up with, and, and that's, I think of that as canonization. Like, what is the canon? The canon are the things we accept as true, that we, you know, we look at the science, and now we know this that we didn't know. In this case, now we know that these interventions are effective. That would be the, the canonical conclusion here. What this study shows, amazing study shows, is that you end up with a scientific literature with a vividly clear consensus that the, the anti-depression interventions are effective, that 90, 95% of the papers are saying that, even though the underlying research is half effective and half ineffective. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> But I mean, like, but here's the thing, okay, like the citation bias, like I just want to take the tail end of this because I was reading some stuff on this. And again, I don't know too much. Um, but let's say a paper is being cited a lot because people are saying this paper is bad. Someone's like, well, look, it's got 10,000 citations. Did you look at what those citations were for? Yeah. So just it's funny that you asked. It's a very timely question um, because experientially, and I realize this doesn't count, except, you know, I have been doing this 30 years. I do have kind of a lot of experience. I'm not presenting my experience with hard scientific data, but experientially, that almost never happens. Stuff that's highly cited, people are almost always citing it because they take it, they accept it, you know, proof value. They're citing because it's helping them make some other argument, which implies they accept its proof value. Okay, that's experientially. But, you know... Like, what does that mean? My, my experience doesn't count for anything. So we're actually doing this now. We are, we are having a small cell study going right now, on right now. Um, there is a very famous pair of studies showing opposite findings. One showing gender bias, uh, pro-male bias in hiring in STEM fields, in science, technology, engineering, and math. And one showing a, a pro-female bias in hiring in science, technology, engineering, and math. So we're completely opposite findings. The amazing thing is, well, there's lots of amazing things. One amazing thing is that the, the study finding pro-male bias um, is cited like seven or eight times as frequently as the one showing pro-female bias. So, uh, the last we checked, there were about 1,500 citations to the study showing pro-male bias, there were about 200 to the study showing pro-female bias. So that means it's at least 1,300 papers that are citing the study showing pro-male bias that don't even mention the other paper. They don't acknowledge its existence. 
So that raises exactly your question. Well, is everybody citing it because they believe it, or are they citing it to say it's a bad study? So I know why they're citing it. They're citing it mostly because they say they believe it. But my knowing it doesn't count for anything. So my lab is in the middle right now of having selected papers that either cite the study showing pro-male bias or cite both. There's very few studies. There's almost no studies that only cite the study showing pro-female bias. So basically most studies, and the overwhelming majority of studies, only, only cite the study showing pro-male bias. There's a, there are some studies sh- citing both. And what we're coding them for is whether they cite the study showing pro-male bias critically are they saying, well, this study found bias serving men, but this study sucks, and here's why it sucks. Or are they just taking it as face value? And, and we're doing the same thing for the papers that cite both studies. And the results are not final. We're mm-hmm. in process, so we're kind of peeked at what's coming through. And it's exactly what, you, uh, exactly what I would have expected. If they're citing one study without citing the other, they're just taking it at face value. Well, you know, STEM is filled with, with you know, pro-male bias, anti-female bias. But I'm not sure that there's a single critical citation in the sample that we're looking at. When they cite both studies, sometimes they cite them, they kind of cite them both uncritically, which is kind of weird. But it's nonetheless true. Right? You, can, you can imagine something written. You know, the, the, um, uh, the first study found uh, bias favoring men in STEM. More text, blah, 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 blah. Later, the study found bias favoring women in STEM. So they're just accepting both as true without actually kind of trying to put the two together and resolve them. So, but nonetheless, what we are preliminarily finding is... is there's very little scientific criticism. Are you still, uh, you look like you froze. No, no, I'm still here. Okay, okay, fine. Okay. So, um, there's very little criticism in any of these papers. But what there is sometimes is what we call doubt. So, there's like accepting the finding uncritically, like bias and STEM. Mm-hmm. And then there's doubt. Because, well, this study found evidence for bias in STEM, but it's really not clear that that's most of what's going on because there's this other study that found the opposite bias in STEM. So we would code that as expressing doubt about the validity of the conclusion. You get more of that when people cite both papers. Okay. But going back to your original question, there's very, very little. I mean, I, I mean, I knew this, but now I'm actually getting the data. There's almost no criticism of studies in in most. There's a little bit out there, but there's very, very little um, actual criticism in most citations. Okay, no, I, like I said, I was just curious because of this is yeah. um, the the publication thing and the gatekeeping. That's one thing that's. And I'm not 100 percent sure about this, and I like the key. So, a journal like Psychology Today, right? Now, the people that edit it, like, I'm not talking about, you know, like, if there's actual article, like, you know, like, I know you have a blog on there, so that's that's you personally, but like, the articles and stuff that come out and the papers that come out, or let's say, like, the New England Journal of Medicine. Now, the review and all that, I'm assuming that's done by psychologists or doctors or whatever, right? Yeah. But the editing process, like... Is that, again, something like the administration in academies? Like, are these people going through programs that are getting them to think a certain way? And so when it comes to editing, even though it's being reviewed by professionals in that field, the editors and the people who are the publishers, the people who are making the final decision on what gets out, have they been taught to think, you know, in like, you know, the grievance studies? I don't know what you want to call those. Like, you know, all those, like... I mean, some of that stuff's infected, like English. It's infected, you know. It's infected a lot. It's kind of the humanities. So I'm just wondering. Like, I just, I'm not, I'm not sure if that's something that's going on there. Well, so just process wise, hmm. editors are usually scientists. They're, okay. They're the academics. They're just academics who have accepted these editorial positions. I mean, I was an editor uh, for one of the sort of moderately high quality social site journals in the 90s. But that's common. That's usually how it's done. People like me, more or less, are, you know, uh, are one way or another, are chosen 
you have to agree to it, obviously, to be the person responsible for editing a journal. Um, and it's actually a mark of accomplishment and sometimes prestige, especially the more prestigious the journal. Uh, but the editor, my point is that the, the editors are not administrators in the same sense as a dean or a provost is. They're academics and scientists themselves. Uh, almost, there may be rare exceptions to that, but those are few and far between. Um, now, that doesn't mean the other part of what you were saying is necessarily not the case. I mean, people, academics, really vary on how much their thinking has been affected or influenced by, you know, for shorthand, grievance, grievance ideology and, uh, and uh, you know, that kind of way of thinking. So, so even though they are themselves academics and scientists, especially in the social sciences, there's just a high level of variability in how much people bring that sort of sensibility to how they edit. Okay. Now, like I said, I, I wasn't sure of the process. I just didn't know. Like, yeah. I, you know, I, I mean, I, I was assuming and hoping that at least the peer review was done by the professionals in the field, right? And then, it is. Yeah. yeah, it is. Yeah. But now, you'd mentioned that, like, we talked about expertise, and this is something I've always, I think this is a problem with expertise and the academy that's kind of causing its own downfall. It's, it got so niche, right? Like, okay, you can be studying, let's say, marine biology. And I, I only bring this up because I actually saw this job posting, and they were looking for a sea cucumber specialist. I'm just thinking, okay, that's a very, very niche section of marine biology, right? Now, now someone who's a sea cucumber specialist, right, sees a paper on the evolution of uh, walruses, whatever, right? I don't know. They're going to say, well, that's not my field of expertise, blah, 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 blah. They can tell you if the methodology was okay or something like that. But, like, is that what's happening in the academy right now? Like, okay, someone in the in a STEM field, right, let's just say chemistry, oh, you need more diversity because we're seeing racism is coming out and they've got a PhD in critical race theory or something. Now, the, the chemist or whatever or the dean of that department says, okay, well, you've got a PhD. You're an expert in your field. It's not my field. I don't have expertise. I'm just going to defer to you. I mean, is, isn't that kind of defeating what the purpose of the academy was? I mean, I understand the having to, to break it off, right? You don't want physicists coming in and telling you how to be a psychologist. And I'm sure they don't want you to come in there telling them how to be physicists. Right. So part of the issue... Okay, so I, I need to be really clear. I'm kind of winging it here. You know, this is me piecing things together, and maybe, you know, maybe my piecing things together has its own weaknesses to it. So they're absolutely possible. But one source of, you know, I, I can't, dysfunction, basically, because it's like broad-spectrum dysfunction, is once upon a time the peer-reviewed scientific journals were, you know, sort of the gold standard for producing credible findings and conclusions that you could believe. But they, they were always imperfect, but they were kind of a gold standard. So then the social sciences and even the humanities adopted that form. And... There's probably a mix of good and bad reasons for why they adopted that form, but one of the bad side effects, in my opinion, has been that because it's all called peer-reviewed, it functions, intentionally or not, as to blur the line between stuff that is based on really strong, hard, and terrible scientific methods, and just people making stuff up. It's all peer reviewed. And so from the outsider's perspective, you know, if you have some grievance journal 
that is basically literally, it's just like a PhD level editorial. I mean, it's their opinions, they're kind of pulling pieces together. There's not anything that would pass for empirical evidence that would be recognizable as such, say, by a physicist or a chemist, then but it's in a peer reviewed journal and it reaches such and such conclusions. Some people, including people in the academy, including people in the natural sciences, will give that a level of credibility kind of comparable to that of something published in a physics journal. Because, you know, it's in a peer-reviewed publication. Yeah. You know, and then, you know, you can get something published saying you examine the genitals of 10,000 dogs in Portland dog parks. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, that's right. I, I just... Yesterday and today, I just discovered a paper that refers to methodological whiteness. Yeah, I saw that this morning, and it's like, come yeah. on. I, it's right. It's like, exactly. It's like, come on. But it's in a peer review journal now. Uh, it's in a peer review journal. I know. Which is, which is someone else kind of like that. Depression intervention thing. I just mm-hmm. someone came out and that. It's been peer reviewed. Yep, and it's. I mean, uh, I know. Okay, this is just something because of, like, you know, I, I I don't speak out a lot about it, but you know, I have friends who do, and like the the whole ex Muslim thing. And there's, you know, this this woman, you know, like her pictures got her in a hijab, and she said, "Objectivity is just whiteness." And it's like, <laughs> uh, I'm like, come on. I mean, like. Well, okay, so I'm more forgiving, to, usually, not always, but in, from a distance anyway, I'm more forgiving of lay people, in people not experts, people who don't have PhDs, yeah. of saying, you know, it's like, I mean, it is a symptom of how, of, of the sort of idea, the intellectual idea production process having this deep reach to the masses. In that sense, it's a problem. But, but I'm way less forgiving of academics and people with PhDs buying into this stuff, which is why, you know, this peer-reviewed the methodological whiteness stuff, it's just nuts. It, it, it is more nuts than any nutcase thing, you know, like a 24-year-old could ever post. Okay, I, and, and I agree with you there that we, okay, like, again, I'm not an academic or whatever. I've read a lot. I started reading a lot of this stuff. I started reading a lot of critical race theory, intersectionality, some queer theory, um, you know, and I mean, when I was in school back in the late eighties, early nineties, I read some postmodernism. Um, but, I, and I'm trying to tell my friends because, you know, friends my age, 50, who, oh, we want to be anti-racist. I'm like, you don't know what that means. You don't know where that comes from. <laughs> and I keep going back to Rauch's book, uh, Rauch's yeah, book. Like, yeah, kind of, yeah. you know, th- this is the humanitarian threat to the Enlightenment. Yeah. Yeah, and it's like, right. you know, oh, don't you want to stop racism? Don't you want to stop extremism? I'm like, right. of course I do. You know, that's like, right. I, right. but it's, this is not the way to do it. And it's, right. and they, like, that's, you know, uh, I had a friend who posted something. Uh, it was an article in Medium about how white people living in trailer parks still experience privilege over black professionals. I'm like, come on! It is. It's, it's, yeah, it's just it's, that side of it is ridiculous. I mean, I, I have two diversity statements. So very early on, I have a very earnest and conventional. A diversity statement on my Rutgers website because I buy that it um, provides a signal to students who might be wondering, is this really a safe environment? And I don't mean safe in like the safe space from the yeah. like, You know, you want students to come in with a mental set that they'll be okay, that they're not going to be, you know, threatened in kind of malicious ways whether it's records generally or my lab or yeah. my classes or whatever it might be. So there's that one. But then I also have one on correct that is basically a mocking of the way um, the endorsement of diversity has been used to essentially uh, instill a certain kind of ideological authoritarian intolerance on people. Oh, yeah. so, 
Yeah. Both are true at the same time. Yeah. That's weird thing. Both are true at the same time. There is obviously there is racism, and yeah. even though there isn't racism, a student, a, say a first generation student from a, a racial ethnic minority background coming to college. Going to not be ridiculous to wonder, like, how are people going to look at me? How are people going to treat me? Even if there, I'm not saying there's nothing nasty going on, but even if there was nothing nasty going on, being kind of on edge a little bit, being kind of alert, high, alert in a way that maybe a white middle class kid doesn't have to be, that's completely reasonable. And there is, I completely accept that there is an onus on people like me to try and allay those fears. Yeah, I mean, that, I agree with all that, and I, but like the you know the, the 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 racism thing, like these diversity. Again, that's another term, like diversity. You know, if you if you read it correctly, the way they say it, you can have a panel that has you know fifty people that are all black. You can have another panel that's fifty people of every demographic that you can think of, but you have one white person on that panel. That panel with one white person is no longer diverse because everyone else is going to be subordinate to the white person. I'm like, excuse me, how can you say that about me and say you want to empower me? Because you're telling me that I have no free will, I can't think for myself, and I'm uh, immediately going to make myself subservient to a white person. Like, Jesus Christ, come on, like. Yeah, no, uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the, that's a version of this sort of authoritarian and tolerant form of diversity and social justice. I mean, there is inequality. There's unjustified inequality. Even when there's justified inequality, I mean, I, from my standpoint, if somebody can't pay their medical bills, it kind of behooves us to find some way to take care of the person. But like, even if it's their own fault, you know? It's like, so, uh, like, okay, I, I, I buy all that. I, I, buy, oh, I buy a lot of that. But that's different than this stuff that is used to just... To, uh, it's uh, you know it's oppressive. It's it's a left wing version of uh, you know what I use for most of my life. That kind of stuff came mostly from the right. I, I hardly ever saw it. Now maybe it was just me, but I hardly ever saw it from the left. You know censorship and you know sort of imposing of one's own sort of unique and subjective morals or attempts to do so on other people. But the last ten years or so, that has shifted. It is at least as bad on the left. It, it may be worse on the left. It may not actually be worse, but it is at least as bad. And it, it has taken a very different form than that kind of attempt to impose subjective morality from the right. I disagree slightly there. I think the right and the left now, like, you know, the whole horseshoe theory thing, I don't think it's a horseshoe anymore. It's a circle. I mean, no, it is because the the right the the left side of it, right? Whatever. I mean, I, I don't like the terms anyway. I don't think they serve they're fit for purpose anymore because they just changed so much. But the left side of things has become more religious, and but the religious. Yeah, yeah, no God, yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. But but I mean, you know, whiteness is original sin. Patriarchy is that's original that's sin. That's okay, that's okay. That's okay. That's okay. That's yeah, yeah. And the right side of it has taken on this social aspect of it as well. You know, yeah. like the, the, yeah. the, tra- the trad Christian thing is becoming like a, so, you know, you know, like, uh, I saw some guy posting this and I'm like, oh, I, women are only good to, to raise children. Once they're past childbearing years, you get a new one. And I'm like, who is that helping? And, you know, and that's coming from religious type of thinking, but they're trying to put social aspect to it. So it, it, I, I don't see, okay, between, okay, someone like Sarah Rao and Candace Owens, the, okay. Yes, well, that's, I completely agree. Okay, you know they, they think different things, but their their way of thinking is the exact same. You know. <laughs> that's true. You know. Well, I, yeah, well, I do agree with that. Well, well so, so I recently, uh, you probably saw me posting on this on, mm-hmm. on Twitter. Um, I recently reread 1984, right? And 1984 is a doorway of the sort of libertarian right because it is just such an in-depth condemnation of so much of, you know, the sort of left, especially left-wing intolerance, which Orwell learned about uh, originally, at least as far as I know, 
um, by fighting with the government, that is the socialists, yeah. um, in the Spanish Civil War. Yeah. He, and, 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 I mean, he fought with them. He fought against the fascists. Like, he shot fascists. He was injured in the war. But what he saw was this sort of, this sort of totalitarian psychology. I mean, they obviously didn't have the power, yeah. but this, this all-encompassing totalitarian ideology of radical leftists, especially the communists. And the great irony of all of Orwell's stuff is he was kind of a social democrat. Like, he, I, you know, I mean, he was British. My guess is he mostly voted, voted labor. Like, I don't know that yeah. for sure. But the way he talked about his politics, that sounds like that would be the case. But he saw exactly what you're describing. I mean, the, the, the big brother government 1984 isn't really obviously left or right. Might have a little more affinity with sort of communist totalitarianism than, say, fascist totalitarianism, but not much. It's really very, very similar. But the grand irony is that I, I think appropriately it is viewed as an expose of the sort of the, the, the sort of left wing implicit totalitarian thinking, even though Orwell himself was actually on the left. Yeah. Okay. I, I wanted to bring that up. The the little the thing you're working on. I think you're calling it the Orwell lexicon. Um, no, 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 no. Okay, but w- when political correctness reared its head in the late '80s, and if I could find the people I used to work with back then, and if they remember it, you know, they might back me up. But I. I said it straight out because there was things that were coming out, um, and also in Quebec because of the whole French English thing. Um, but right. but there was also like a, a, the one I remember the most was they wanted to get rid of the terms waiter and waitress and use the term waitron. And <laughs> then in Quebec they wanted to get rid of hamburger because people even you know the French would say uh, done one hamburger, um, and they wanted to call it a hamburgeois. And like when this stuff was coming out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I knew about the Richards. I didn't know about the Hamburg's Law. That's yeah, right. Yeah. But like when I when this stuff was coming out, I told like you know, okay, I was I was graduating from high school. Like I I turned eighteen in uh, in eighty seven, right? So like it was right after then. But I told the other people I was working with, I'm like, this is you know, newspeak. This is Orwellian newspeak. Yeah. It's it's language without function. It has no meaning. I mean, these words. Okay, Although all the stuff of the green studies, the, the, the authoritarianism, everything, like it's all bad. But on a personal level, the thing I think I hate the most about it is it's making me hate language. I loved reading. I, I love reading. And I, 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 lo- I love like the way George Carlin can play with words. And these people are making me hate the goddamn language. They're, they're, they're turning it into such a travesty. <laughs> well, well, so, so I don't know. So I completely see what you're saying, and uh, like get that. In fact, one of the things I post on is like the twisted meaning of words and how that, you know, how the corruption of words that represent ideas is one of the go-to tools on this sort of critical theory, intersectional, uh, dogmatic left. But I don't have the same reaction of hating language because I'm the other guy. I have like, I don't know, 120 papers, I have a bunch of books. I love to write. Right? I have mean, this long blog thing. I love to write. It can't make me hate words. So my reaction is the opposite is to play with words. And that is what produced the old lexicon. Right? It, it's like, okay, what we need is a rhetoric, a, a, a rhetoric to counter this demented, twisted stuff that is coming out of the sort of radical, dogmatic, you know, regressive left. And so doing that with a certain humor, like, it's just, like this mix of seriousness and humor is what inspired the old lexicon. It's basically playing with language and words. It's literally playing because about half or more of the words I didn't originate. I'll have to like start a conversation on Twitter and I'll say, I need help with this. Here's an idea. You know, what do you think would be a good term? Or like, is this the best way to describe it? And people will respond and then you respond. So we go back and forth and it's like, oh yeah, then that captures it. And that's playing with language. Yeah, okay, no, okay. And again, I, I like that. I appreciate it. When I say it makes me hate language, it's like, I, I, I don't want to get rid of language. I don't want to get rid of words. But you know, now when I hear the word problematic, I cringe. I know, right? Okay, you know, it's, it's just it's just certain things like that. You know, yeah. and, and they come up with like you know a, a term like positionality. Like, what the hell is that supposed to mean? Like, come on, it's just. And, and then okay, and I like I said, I slogged through some of these books, and they're painful to read. And I'm 
I'm actually considering going back and reading some of the postmodernism stuff because it's been, you know, I read it in the late late 80s, early 90s, so it's been a long time. Um, especially, I want to try to, like, I would be speaking to a few people, and, you know, James Lindsay, I spoke to him, and uh, Matt McManus about postmodernism on the right. And so maybe I'm like, because... Like I've been arguing about the, you know, I've been arguing about the left hand, left side of the things, but the the right side is, you know, the Candace Owens, the Charlie Kirks, like those people aren't sane. They're they're not, <laughs> you know, no, but, but but they shouldn't be to the counter to the, you know, to, know. you know, like they shouldn't. And if that's if that's where we're at, like you know, bring on bring on the meteor because God damn it, like <laughs> you know, it's painful. <laughs> The, in New York, New York has a very, even though New York is an overwhelmingly liberal area, it has a very strong right-wing media, a talk radio presence. <laughs> Almost all the political talk radio is right, right-wing. Um, and they vary. You know, like some are just sort of ideological nutcases and they're preaching to the choir and they, you know, yeah. you know, they're kind of smug and self-satisfied and it's, you know, there's some mix of reasonable stuff and just aggravating to me stuff. But there are a couple, there, there, there are a couple of um, shows that uh, aspire to something better. And even though they also lean right, they're just more thoughtful. There's this one guy, John Batchelor, um, who has this evening show and, you know, sometimes it's politics and sometimes it's kind of right-wing political grandstanding and it's like, okay, I'll, you know, I'll listen to something else now. But he also does all sorts of interesting stuff, including he has, like, history professors on who will talk about, you know, a subset of battles during the Civil War that turned the tide in some way. It's just really interesting stuff. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so... I don't know. I don't know what my point is. My point is that there are, there are the net cases on the right, and then there's also the reasonable right. I okay. guess that's my... No, 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 but that's just it. Like, but unfortunately... The reasonableness on both sides is being drowned out. Yes, that's true. And you know, and yeah. like when I okay, I came back from overseas in 2014, and that's when I started seeing all this stuff. Like I was on military bases. I yeah. didn't. Have, I didn't have Facebook and all this stuff. You know, I had very little of it. So it was like you know, total culture shock. I'm like, what the hell is going on? Yeah. Um, but it's the, the you know, you can't. You're not going to get a following unless you're screaming. You're not going to go you know, like it's 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 it's. There's very few. You know, okay, like Sam Harris, Lucky, whatever. I mean, I shouldn't just say luck. The guy's talented, and intelligent, and well spoken. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, he got into it before all this stuff happened, and he built himself. You know, same thing with like yeah. Richard Dawkins, which you know, there's some of the stuff he puts out now, which I'm thinking, okay, maybe stop, maybe get off Twitter, Richard. You're a little too old for it. <laughs> uh, but whatever. I mean, like, you know, uh, but. Now, like, if you want to start talking, like, no one wants reasonableness. Everyone is, yeah. you know, I, I see it with people who are like the the anti SJW. They're, they're, I'm like, you're the same thing, though. Oh, you can't talk to these people. They don't listen to you. They don't. I'm like, have you read any of their books? No. But, <laughs> but you're, you're doing the same thing. That's, 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 you know, like, um, yeah. oh, it's, it's, it's getting a bit much. Look, uh, I don't want to keep you too, too long. Thanks a lot for talking. I, if you got anything else you want to talk about, man, I, I'm good to go. I, let yeah, anything off your chest? Yeah, this is yeah, yeah this has been great. We, I, I I would say that was a sufficiently rambling yet interesting <laughs> conversation that we can we can call it here. Yeah. So, All right. Well, if you want to let people know, I, I, if you want to let people know where they can get a hold of you, uh, find you, whatever. Uh, I, yeah, yeah, I should totally do that, shouldn't I? I you know, I was always. Not good at shameless self promotion, but uh, but if we're going to do that, so uh, um, probably the best place would be my blog at Psych Today, so it's Psychology Today Rabble Rouser, um, and uh, you can that's like a gateway to other ways to contact me. You'll find my Twitter account, my Rutgers publications there, so that's probably the best way to reach to, to find out. All right, well, I'll put the link to that in the description. Also, if you can send me that article that you know, we were discussing with the dots and all that, I'll put yeah. a link to that and the time. Sam, so people can take a look at it. Yeah. Anyways, thanks a lot for coming on, and thank you everyone for listening.